Welcome to our orthopedics webinar series. My name is Sarah Hibner, and on behalf of Premier Health and Premier Health's orthopedic specialists, I'd like to thank each of you for attending this evening. We're so glad to have you with us. Tonight, we are here to discuss overuse injuries. A specialization in organized sports continues to climb in popularity. Youth athletes are at greater risk for overuse injuries. Our physician expert, Scott Albright, MD, will give a brief presentation this evening on common causes of overuse injuries and practical tips for preventing them. He will also answer some of your questions following his presentation. To submit a question, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. There may also be a chat button on your screen, but please disregard that and send your questions by clicking the Q&A button. We will try to get to as many of them as possible tonight. Also, this seminar will be recorded, so you will receive a link to the recording via email should you want to go back and reference any portion of this evening's presentation. So let's start off by introducing our speaker. Dr. Scott Albright is a board certified uh, sports medicine physician, a graduate of the Wright State University Boonshoff School of Medicine, Dr. Albright completed his residency and fellowship training in sports medicine at Riverside Methodist Hospital. He specializes in non-surgical orthopedic sports medicine and musculoskeletal injuries. In addition to being a credentialed impact consultant, trained in treating con concussions. Additionally, Dr. Albright serves as team physicians for several area schools. Dr. Albright practices at Premier Orthopedics one of the largest and highly trained orthopedic and sports medicine practices in Southwest Ohio. The practice offers the full range of treatment options from exercise and physical therapy to injections, pain management, and surgery where needed, including minimally invasive arthroscopic and robotic, um, robotic arm knee procedures. With nearly 30 doctors and more than 12 locations, Premier Orthopedics is ready where and when you need help. So thank you, Dr. Albright, for being with us this evening, and I will turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining in. And so hopefully this will be a pretty informative lecture on just overall how to prevent uh, overuse injuries as we're getting into the fall, lots of sports, lots of our kiddos are playing lots of sports. And so hopefully I can give you some insights in how to prevent some of the more nagging chronic injuries. So here's just a brief outline on kind of what we're gonna go over. Uh, the actual presentation should not take very long, so there'll be plenty of time for questions that I'll happy uh, to answer. Next slide. So the common fall sports injuries. So this topic that we're gonna to discuss tonight certainly will encompass all sports. It doesn't matter that it's the fall, winter, spring sports. Um, everything that I have in, the, in these slides can certainly be utilized for any sports, but, you know, certainly we're in the football, soccer, cheerleading, even fall baseball. So the more common injuries that we see, concussion, fractures, muscle strains, shin splints, ligament injuries, you know, certainly those are all the injuries that we see. Most of those are acute injuries. This talk is actually going to focus more on how to prevent some of the more chronic overuse type injuries that actually account for the majority of what I see in the office. Next talk, next slide. So overuse is one of the most common factors that lead to injuries in the pediatric and adolescent athlete. So it's basically a microtraumatic damage to a bone, muscle, or tendon that's been subjected to a repetitive stress without sufficient time to heal or undergo a natural healing process. So a lot of these injuries, stress fractures, um, chronic tendon injuries, chronic muscle injuries are some of the more uh, common ones that we'll see in the office that certainly could actually be prevented by some of the guidelines that we're going to go over later on in the presentation. Next slide. So there are stages of overuse injuries which are kind of key to recognize to be able to prevent um, the injuries from getting worse. So number one, pain in the area after activity. This one, you know, everybody will have that typically after any sporting event, any activity. So we don't get too concerned after number one. Then the second, pain during the activity, but not restricting performance. 
this is where we start to pay closer attention to maybe we're developing a more chronic overuse injury that may need uh, further evaluation. Number three, pain that restricts activity during performance. And then finally, chronic pain at rest is when we've definitely developed into a more chronic injury that would need to be evaluated. Next slide. So 50% of injuries seen in youth sports are related to overuse. The other 50% are the acute injuries like the fractures, the ligament sprains, the concussions, that the only way to really prevent those is, well, if you don't play sports. And so that would not, uh, we wouldn't need this lecture if none of us played sports. So it might make my job pretty boring. So the, you know, the 50% of injuries that we see the majority of the time that I see actually in the office, the, um, the majority of the athletes are actually girls cross country. And we see it more in the endurance athletes uh, where they'll come in for overuse injuries. But then we also have, uh, you know, the pediatric athlete, the pitchers and gymnasts and the cheerleaders that we get concerned with as well with overuse. So the young pitchers, we get concerned with elbow fractures, um, due to their growth plates that are weaker than the ligaments surrounding them that can actually be injured with overuse. And then the young gymnasts and cheerleaders, stress fractures of the spine are quite common. That certainly is directly related to overuse. Next slide. So overtraining is uh, one part of the overuse uh, phenomenon. So there's no real concrete guidelines that determine how much exercise is healthy versus what might be harmful and represent overtraining. Um, sound training regiment is essential, and although repetition is important, it may induce harm if done excessively. And so that's the difficult part of it is, well, what's excessive and what is not enough? And there was a big study done in British Journal of Sports Medicine that actually tried to look at this, but actually it was very difficult. And so there was no real sound guidelines in terms of, well, what constitutes too much and what's too little. So that's where, you know, that previous slide where we had to look at kind of the stages of overuse injuries uh, comes into play. Next slide. So the Amer American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and American College of Sports Medicine recommends limiting one sporting activity to a maximum of five days per week with at least one day off from organized activities. In addition, you should have two to three months per year from that particular sport. And if the body is not given enough time to regenerate and refresh, then burnout can occur. And so the body, it has a remarkable ability to heal, but if you keep over, uh, you know, overdoing it, then the body will just continue to degenerate and not regenerate. Next slide. So I threw this in. This is actually a nice chart. Uh, we have a lot of fall baseball players and a lot of pitching. And so one of the more common injuries that we'll see are in young pitchers, especially in their elbows and shoulders. And so this is a pitch count that comes in handy to just as a guideline that, you know, this was well researched and this helps prevent a lot of overuse injuries with elbows that can be catastrophic. You know, a lot of people think that, oh, well, I'll just have my kid throw a lot of pitches, and if they end up needing a Tommy John surgery, their elbow will be stronger, but not necessarily the case. You know, technology is wonderful these days, but it still doesn't make the elbow, you know, completely natural, and, you know, you want to prevent a 10-year-old from having to have a Tommy John surgery, which are becoming more and more common these days, which is quite unfortunate, and then there was a, a big study done by Major League Baseball that looked at you know, youth pitchers in terms of how many innings they threw in a season. And so if they threw less than 100 uh, innings in a season, their injury rate um, was much less. And if they threw greater than 100 uh, innings in a season, their injury was three and a half times more than the other pitchers. So it's just a, a very good guideline. That's why I put this in here, because it's just extremely important, uh, especially in those young kiddos that are uh, throwing. Next slide. So burnout, burnout's a big uh, topic, especially, you know, as more and more kids play sports and they're getting bombarded by uh, 
you know, a lot of schoolwork and a lot of outside influences. So, uh, you know, burnout is overtraining syndrome is a series of psychological, physiological, and hormonal changes that result in decreased sport performance. You know, one may have fatigue, lack of enthusiasm about practice or games, and may find it difficult to complete usual routines. You know, this may seem like just a typical teenager when they have those symptoms, but uh, it can actually be um, a sign that they may be getting burnout, especially if they really enjoy that particular sport. So prevention of burnout should be addressed by encouraging the athlete to be well-rounded in a variety of activities. And so I'll have some guidelines that um, are coming up to help prevent burnout. Next slide. So these are the guidelines that really do help uh, prevent burnout in these kids, which, you know, certainly if someone does experience burnout, it can be with them forever in terms of not really wanting to play any more sports. So we certainly want to discourage that. Um, so number one, keeping workouts interesting with age appropriate training, taking time off from organized sports one to two days per week and permit longer scheduled breaks from training every two to three months while focusing on other activities. And then finally, focus on wellness and teaching athletes to listen to their bodies for cues to slow down or alter training methods. You know, this last one's really important. Um, you know, it used to be the old adage of, oh, rub some dirt on it and get back out there if it hurts. But, you know, certainly if athletes complaining of really prolonged injuries or nagging injuries, it really is important to listen to them and, you know, see if there truly is something going on pathologic with it. And that's where the athletic trainers really have become kind of a godsend just to help for the athletes in terms of being able to actually kind of tune that in and being able to send it to us when it's been appropriate. Next slide. So year-round training, this has become a bigger um, aspect in pretty much every sport um, that, you know, a lot of the coaches think, well, you know, year round, if you play it, you know, one season, if you do it year round, you're going to be, you know, much better, but not necessarily the case. You know, it's very common in soccer, baseball, and gymnastics to do this, but there's a lot of pressure from parents and coaches to specialize in thinking that, oh, well, you know, you do that, then I'm going to get a college scholarship or even go pro or be on an Olympic team. And really only 0.2 to 0.5% of high school athletes ever make it to the pro level. And really about two to maybe 3% actually go into college to play the sport. So not many athletes really ever do this. And, you know, there's a lot of studies been done on this and looking at people in Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, and most of those athletes are just so gifted that they really never had to, you know, train very hard in high school or anything like that. And so when they got to college, they were just natural athletes. And then they started to, you know, have to work a little harder. But when you start getting in that level, usually it's just natural talent. You know, a few of those that are able to make it just through gut and hard work, but majority of folks you're going to make it to high school and then athletic career is, you know, going to be pretty social after that. So there is definitely a higher risk of burnout and injury of specializing in one sport at a young age. Next slide. So multi-sport athletes, you know, well-rounded multi-sport athletes have the highest potential to achieve the goal of lifelong fitness and enjoyment of sports while avoiding some of the overuse and burnout. So, these athletes that participate in multiple sports during the same season, however, at the greatest risk of injury and burnout due to lack of breaks, and especially those that play in two or more sports that emphasize the same body part, such as pitching and swimming. And so it's always a good recommendation to try to do sports that have different body parts, because if you're beating up on the same body part day in and day out, and during games and practices, definitely burnout, overtraining, and injuries will certainly become uh, much more common. Next slide. So these last few slides are kind of the take-home message of the guidelines on how do we prevent these kids from getting these chronic injuries, from being burnout, and just really enjoying sports just because sports have so much to offer in terms of just socialization and 
being fit and actually just making kids, you know, more well-rounded. So number one, encourage the athletes to have at least one to two days off per week from competitive sports training and practice to allow their bodies to recover. And it takes a good 24 hours to really recover from an intense workout. And so if they're having intense workouts seven days a week, they, their body has no chance of being able to recover and the injuries just pile up. So number two, advise athletes that weekly training time, number of reps and distances should not increase by more than 10% each week. And this is really important with cross country runners, track runners, that they're not really increasing their mileage as if they do more than that 10% each week, the risk of stress fracture becomes much greater. And it's been shown about 50% greater if they're increasing that 10% each week. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. Encourage the athletes to take two to three months away from the specific sport uh, during the year. It just helps clear their mind and just, again, helps the body recover from that particular sport um, especially, you know, when one body part really takes the brunt of the uh, injuries. And then number four, encourage the athlete to participate in only one team during the season. If the athlete is a member of a select team, then the participation time should be incorporated into the above guidelines. Next slide. So the last two guidelines, number five, if the athlete complains of nonspecific muscle or joint problems, fatigue or poor academic performance, be alert for burnout and try to intervene as quickly as possible. The sooner you can kind of recognize the burnout, then the better the athlete will be and they'll be able to actually turn it around a little quicker and be able to get back into their sport and enjoy it more. And number six, just be aware of the physical and emotional toll of multi-game tournaments in a short period of time. You know, there's a lot of uh, folks that come in the office that have uh, that play multiple tournaments. They'll go to play soccer, then they'll go play baseball, then they'll have another tournament, and it's just way too much. And they wonder why, well, you know, the knees chronically hurt or, you know, their elbows hurt. And so it's just something to be really aware of, especially as a parent that, you know, sometimes – we want to live vicariously through our kids, but their bodies sometimes and their minds can't take it. So hopefully this lecture just kind of shed some light on how to prevent more of the chronic nagging injuries that overtraining and over overuse does. Um, you know, like I said, the acute injuries that will happen in any sport. Um, those are easier to take care of than some of these more chronic uh, injuries that can be with you for a lifetime. So hopefully you take something home with us and I'll be able to uh, answer any questions anyone has. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you, Dr. Albright. Um, just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A, which you can find by hovering your cursor over the bottom of your Zoom window. So our first question is, how can an athlete determine pain from training versus pain from overuse? Yeah, so typically pain from training, if it's just specifically from one training event, that should go away within 24 to 48 hours. If it's more from overtraining, no amount of rest, you know, in that given 24 to 48 hours, typically that pain will remain. And usually, even if it's from overtraining, even a week won't reduce that pain. So usually if you give it a good several days and that pain is still there, then typically it's a good sign that it is from overtraining. Is physical therapy an option to help both avoid overuse injuries as well as correct them if they um, occur? Yeah, so physical therapy is usually kind of the first go-to, especially once an injury has occurred, a chronic injury. Um, and then it can be used as a prevention. That's where we have the trainers and they're so valuable in terms of just trying to prevent the overuse injuries. And coaches nowadays are actually much more in tune to being able to uh, differentiate between those two and actually trying to prevent. We, most schools now have strength and conditioning coaches which um, are employed for that reason and which do a, a great job of you know, really helping prevent some of the overuse injuries. Okay. 
So can injections help with overuse injuries and specifically um, platelet-rich plasma treatments? Yeah, so that's a good question. I do a lot of uh, PRP injections, especially for chronic injuries. Um, one of the biggest things with chronic injuries is that tendons are involved. Tendons don't have a lot of blood flow to the area. And so once tendons start to become damaged, they're no longer inflamed. And so once the inflammation goes away, the healing process stops. And so what the tendon does is it tries to thicken and it's called neovascularization where you get little new nerve endings and blood vessels that form. And so PRP is actually a great way to introduce the healing factors into a, like a chronic injury to help it heal. So I do that quite often and it works very well. It's just painful and it does take four to six weeks to heal up. So doing something like that in season is not one of my favorite uh, go-tos just because it, it does hurt and they have to be shut down for a little while. Um, we do have a question about concussions. Um, when can an athlete get back to his or her sport following a concussion? So there is no concrete answer with that. It all has to do with what's called the return to play protocol. So once the athlete is completely symptom free, meaning no headaches, no fogginess, no nausea, no light or noise sensitivity, then they can actually start um, their journey back to playing. And so there's five return to play uh, steps that one does and they slowly increase their activity until they get back to their full um, full sport participation, which can take usually at minimum about five days. Sometimes it can take up to seven days once the athlete is symptom free, but that can take anywhere from a few days to even several weeks. Okay, next question. Should a high school athlete continue weight training during shoulder rehab? All depends on what they're rehabbing the shoulder for. If it's post-surgery, then they'll want to really follow the protocol from the surgeon in terms of what they can do. They can certainly lift you know, the legs safely um, and the contralateral arm that wasn't operated on or even that had the injury, but you want to be careful with lifting too heavy because you can just really re-injure the shoulder that you're trying to rehab. Okay, great. Next question. Um, can an athlete continue playing a sport with an ACL tear? That is a good question. I've had several recently already and with that regard. So with an ACL tear, it is difficult to play you know, quote unquote skilled position in football or even soccer in any cutting type activity. Um, I've had offensive linemen go back their senior season, play with an ACL and then have it fixed after the season. It's very difficult for the athlete to do that because their knee feels unstable even with an ACL brace. Um, and then it can actually cause other injuries to the knee um, with that instability without the ACL. So it can be done. It's not recommended, but in certain circumstances, I have had athletes go back and play with an ACL tear. Okay. We have one question uh, remaining open, um, but we still have plenty of time. So if you have a question you'd like to submit, feel free to type it into the to the Q&A. Um, otherwise, our final question would be, uh, when should a patient um, experience relief after they receive a cortisone injection? So it can be anywhere from, depending on the cortisone injected, it can be anywhere from 24 hours up to a full week before they feel uh, relief. Okay, there is one more, uh, one more question. Um, is there a specific exercise a female soccer player uh, should perform to prevent an ACL tear? Yeah, so that has been the big um, 
lots of people have looked at this and there are um, definitely exercises. So the biggest ones that we have found actually include those that help with proprioception in terms of how the brain talks to the lower extremities, especially in how they're cutting and how they're landing. So there are definitely some box squat uh, exercises that they can do to help with landing. And that's been the biggest one that we have found is a lot of girl soccer players, when they've looked at how they've come off of the box squat when they're jumping, they actually land with their knees kind of touching each other. And so trying to retrain the way they're landing and um, the way their feet land and the way they're cutting can help reduce uh, amount of ACL tear. So there's lots of uh, protocols for this. There's actually people that just solely uh, um, do this for a living in terms of trying to train um, athletes to for ACL uh, prevention. Are female athletes more likely to get certain types of overuse injuries? Yeah, so female athletes, you know, certainly um, can have little more um, issues with tendons just because especially young, younger age they grow faster than boys do um, and then they quickly stop and then the boys you know then start to grow a little bit ahead of them in high school and eighth grade but uh, what I have found is certainly with females it's more of going to be kind of the patellar tendon and just generalize what's called patellofemoral syndrome where the kneecap just really doesn't go up and down the groove the way it should. So that's one um, issue that females definitely have a lot more uh, than males do. Okay, another question. My 12-year-old my son pitches baseball. Should he throw curveballs at his age or if not, what is the recommended age? Yeah, so Curveballs, typically, it used to be the old adage was, well, as soon as they have hair on their face, they can start throwing a curveball. Uh, that's kind of gone down a little bit in age, but that the problem with a curveball is at 12, depending on how open their growth plates are, that torque on the elbow can really cause uh, quite a bit of stress on it, which leads to injury. So at that age, it all depends on where they are maturation wise. Um, so some 12 year olds absolutely can throw curveballs. other 12 year olds, not so much. So that's the age where it really becomes uh, depending on their musculature and how, how developed they are. Okay, and then this would be our Final question, unless anyone would like to submit uh, an additional one. Um, when, when should someone seek medical attention for a sports injury they think may be due to overuse? Yeah, so if you think it's overuse and you've done all the normal rest, ice, compression, elevation, and you've given it you know, a good uh, week to two weeks of rest and there is still no um, you know, no resolution, then certainly that's the time to uh, seek medical treatment. Is uh, CrossFit a better form of training um, for athletes? CrossFit is a good form of training. It's not necessarily better. It's more low impact. So depending on, you know, if there is any uh, knee injuries or ankle injuries or any lower extremity injuries, uh, CrossFit can be a little a better way or any lower impact activity, but, you know, it certainly it is a good uh, form of uh, fitness for athletes. It's not the best, but it's, it's a good form. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Albright, for your informative presentation. We appreciate your time and expertise. And I want to thank um, you all so much for joining us this evening. I hope that you have found the information shared useful. We feel privileged to be with you tonight and hope you will consider us for any healthcare needs you may have.
If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Albright or his practice, Premier Orthopedics, you can visit premierorthooh.com. More information about Dr. Albright can also be found on his bio that was sent along with the information to access tonight's event. Should you have additional questions or would like to make an appointment, his office phone number is on the website and on his bio. Last but not least, as a reminder, the seminar was recorded. We will email you a link to the recording should you want to go back and listen to some or all of this great content again. As soon as, as it is available, we will share the URL. Along with the recording URL, we will share a link to a short survey on tonight's program. We value your feedback and would appreciate if you could take a few minutes to share your thoughts with us. And with that, we wish you all a good evening. Thanks again.